I invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll be reading for the very end of this chapter, chapter 15, verse 50. As you have noticed, then through all through this service, Jesus is what Christianity is all about. His life, his death, his resurrection. And Paul now summarizes this great chapter of resurrection uh, and brings it together. It's probably the, the, the most thorough examination of the resurrection in all of his writings, certainly, and of all of the Bible. It's a masterpiece. Uh, one scholar said that it's Paul that is argumentative best. Uh, in the good sense of the word, argumentative. He is fighting for the resurrection in this chapter. Because some in the church of Corinth uh, were, as today, were wondering, is it really that important that we believe in a physical resurrection of Jesus Christ? Isn't Christianity more about my relationship to him and my spiritual connection with other people, with uh, the church and with loving my neighbor? Isn't that what Christianity is about? And these Christians, even today, slip into a futureless faith. It's all about what I'm experiencing right now. Your best uh, life now is a good example of that, which will eventually lead, I, I fear, to your only life now. And like today, the Corinthians were wondering about this. In the first century uh, Greco-Roman world, it's very similar to our world. It, it, a lot of people were spiritual. They were very uh, religious uh, in their own way, but they didn't have much of a view for the afterlife. It was fuzzy at best for them. And the Corinthians were being influenced by this, and some were saying there's really no need for a physical resurrection of a body down the road for us. Uh, some had drifted away from what the apostles uh, had taught from the beginning, and they couldn't understand how a physical body, a resurrected body, would be needed in an eternal, in a perfect world. And they were being influenced by their society, the, the idea of spirituality and physicality being separate categories altogether and never overlapping. Well, as R.C. Sproul said, ideas have consequences and theology, even bad theology, matters. So it was causing confusion within the church of Corinth. And in chapter 15, Paul begins by establishing the certainty of Christ's physical resurrection. He does it by appealing to scripture, by talking quite extensively, as we confessed, of the eyewitnesses that saw Jesus. And then even his own experience, he had experienced the resurrection himself. And then in verse 12 of chapter 15, Paul argues for the centrality of the resurrection. What difference does it really make if Christ rose or he didn't rise? And he there establishes the great connection between Christ's resurrection and our future resurrection. That if one's going to happen, the other's going to happen. And, and brings that together that Christ's resurrection really is our resurrection. And then in verse 20, he shows the consequences of Christ's resurrection. And there are cosmic consequences, he points out, ethical consequences, and even sacramental consequences for the resurrection. And then in verse 35, he switches again, and he talks about the character of the resurrection body. What kind of body will we have in the future when Christ returns? And it will be us, but it will be a new us. It will be a new form of our body. Uh, it will be imperishable, we confess. It will be glorious. It will be powerful. It will be spiritual. It will be like Christ's resurrection body. We will bear his likeness, even as we bear the likeness of the first man, Adam. And now in verse 50, Paul comes to that Fifth uh, C, if you've been following my thought here, the coming of the resurrection. Here Paul comes to his conclusion about it all. And he doesn't really bring anything new in as far as his argument for the resurrection. But he does mention a new group. Uh, believers who are alive on earth when Jesus returns and the resurrection day occurs. What about them? Will they miss out on the resurrection? And there may have been some confusion in the church of Corinth about that. They were possibly thinking that this last generation wouldn't really be given a resurrection body because they never really died before. And so Paul writes to correct that and does even more. Let's hear the word of the Lord from 
uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, beginning uh, at uh, verse uh, 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let's pray together. Father, we do ask that you would help us now as we need your attention. We need your Holy Spirit's attention. That our hearts would be open, that we would be able to receive your word, heard and, and then now understood And then ready to be taken into life. Lord, help us, we pray, to do that. As we learn more of our future resurrection. As we learn more of your great love for us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This spring, our lives have totally changed, have they not? Uh, Even a month ago, it would be strange to imagine that we would be wearing masks as we go around and standing six feet apart and waiting in lines for food and working at home, told by our government to not come out of our houses unless it's absolutely necessary. And this got me thinking this week about how many changes there have been in the history of the world and where different things just changed everything. We can think when people were able to harness fire for the first time, how that changed everything. Or when the wheel was invented, that changed everything. Or major migrations, the discovery of the new world changed so much. The French Revolution changed so much. Feudalism was dead from that point on. The American Revolution, democracy was on the rise. The Industrial Revolution and all the different things that come out of that, blessings and curses, changed our lives. Air travel, uh, PCs cell phones. You could could go on and on about the things that have changed our lives, and yet the greatest change for us is still up ahead. When one of my favorite uh, bookstores was closing, I picked up a book, and I didn't know much about the author, and but it's a book I really found helpful. It's a devotional book. I recommend it to you called Beyond Doubt by Cornelius Plantinga. And he takes it, he's been working on these devotional two pages uh, each day for some time. And they're just tight and wonderful and, 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 and just powerful. And one of them says this, it says, we can't see heaven or the things of heaven. We can't even see much of what God is doing in our world. We walk by faith, not by sight. And to be honest, our faith often fails to grasp the reality of what it confesses. The things of faith can seem airy and remote. Such things as dreams are made of. But one day, we will see and hear a stirring commotion outside. Jesus Christ will return in power. The play will be over. The lights will come on. And we will be confronted by not just our Lord, by a whole heavenly community. An invasion. A whole new world. Something, says C.S. Lewis, it never entered in our head to conceive. Talk about a change. The prophets called it the day of the Lord. 
Jesus referred to it as the renewal of all things. Peter says it will be the restoration of all things. John talked about it as the new heaven and the new earth, like a bride beautifully prepared for her husband coming down out of heaven. This is a cosmic change. Will include not only a change for us, but a change in us. We will be changed. We must be changed to experience it. The Corinthians were wrong about their saying that we don't really need a a physical resurrection to uh, live. But they were right about the fact that our bodies presently are not able to experience what God has in store for his people. There must be this dramatic, this radical, this cosmic, this bodily change in our being, in our bodies. And this is why Paul says in verse 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He's not saying here, in a a kind of a misunderstanding, going back to the second century, says that because he's said already that we have a spiritual body, that this body that Christ will give us at the resurrection day is not tangible. He doesn't say that. The spiritual doesn't mean intangible or non-physical. Jesus had a a physicality about his resurrection body. He could go um, and be touched. He could eat uh, fish. He he was held on to. There was a tangibility there, but his body was totally different. And flesh and blood was a Jewish idiom for human beings, generally. That human beings, as they are right now, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. They must be changed. Our bodies are, are... right now perishable. They must be imperishable to experience this. Our bodies right now are in no condition to live in the new heaven and the new earth. And therefore, this change must take place. We must be resurrected. And this is what Paul says is the mystery. We will not all uh, go to heaven first, but we all will be changed on that great and glorious day. Both those in heaven and those on earth will be be resurrected. Remember the people in heaven that have gone before us don't have a resurrection body. Their body was left here, buried or cremated. They are with the Lord. Yes, they have a home with him there, but they are not resurrected yet. But on this great resurrection day, all God's people will be resurrected. Not all will sleep. Not all will die and go to heaven, but all will be changed. That idea of sleep is a wonderful one, isn't it? In the scriptures, we find that Christians are talked about as sleeping when they die. Why is that? Well, that certainly is the separation of body and and soul. and, and, And this is showing that it's temporary, just like sleep is temporary. And that this separation is not a harmful thing. With a person sleeping, we think they're at peace. They're, they feel they're, something good is happening, not bad is happening. And so Jesus uses this phrase of, of when we die, we sleep. But more importantly, that our bodies one day will wake up. One day, the bodies that have been lost and we couldn't even put their bodies back together physically together the lord will put it back together and those bodies will be raised imperishable by god's grace and this is the mystery and he's using the word mystery not in the sense of this is something that you can't understand like the trinity he's not saying this is a mystery in the sense that this is a secret that you have to tuck away we sometimes use the word mystery for those things or a puzzle that we have to figure out When the Bible uses the word, New Testament particularly uses the word mystery, it's talking about something that we wouldn't ever know unless God revealed it to us. We wouldn't ever know unless God took the veil off and showed us this is what's going to happen. And the resurrection to come is that. It's a mystery. And everyone who belongs to Christ will be raised. This great, this big cosmic change is coming. Notice that he says the change will come instantaneously. In a flash that word in Greek is the word Adam, not the man Adam, but Adam as we think of atoms and molecules. And it literally means to not cut. Uh, Adam cannot be divided as what the thought was. It was the smallest thing that couldn't be divided. When applied to time, 
It means it's so fast that it can't be even distinguished. Like a split second, we would say, or a nanosecond, or, or lickety split is an old phrase that was used for that. Jesus uses the, the image of lightning flashing and coming. It's like the twinkling of an eye. Before you can even blink, you will be in your resurrection body. And then the trumpet is sounding. Why a trumpet? Well, trumpets in the Old Testament are calls to people. They are calls, it, it, even today, as I went to Jerusalem and, uh, uh, a few years ago, and, and the corner of the temple, there's a piece that fell off, and the piece that fell off at that corner top of the, of the temple mount was a piece where the, the trumpeter would sound the blast and would call people to Sabbath worship. Trumpets were used to sound alarms and to warn of enemies coming and telling the, the soldiers to grab their weapons and, and, and get going. It was there at the day of Sinai when the law was given. There was a loud, lasting trumpet. King has come. It's summoning God's people to the king is what it is. And Jesus says in Matthew 24 uh, that he will send his angels, the son of man will, and a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. It's a gathering call. It's a summoning call that we're all going to be there by his grace. And then so it's a fast, instantaneous coming. But it's also a radical change. That our bodies which perish now will not wear out. We'll never have to come to Jesus and say, you know, I just need another body, Jesus. Would you just give me another body? Mine has worn it. No, our bodies will not wear out. And they will never die. They're immortal. They will be immortal. No one will have to weep over them anymore as you have wept over the bodies of your loved ones. No one will ever have to, to wash and bury a body and prepare it for burial anymore. Remember as a kid, my dad came back. His dad, his dad had just died at home. And he told me about closing his dad's eyes that were staring off. And I thought, wow, what a, what a thing death is. That will be no more. The bodies that we have will be glorious in form. And this must happen. Why does Paul say it must happen? Why doesn't he content just to simply say it's going to happen? No, it must happen, he says. It must happen because if the whole movement of the argument all the way through the chapter, because of our union with Christ and his resurrection body, we will be raised. Our resurrection will come because of his. His resurrection is our resurrection. His body wasn't stolen. It wasn't misplaced on the first day. It wasn't resuscitated even. It was radically changed on the day of resurrection. And our bodies will go through the same process. Paul says in Philippians 3.21, we eagerly await a savior who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Because of his resurrection, it starts a resurrection event that will continue on and affect our bodies someday and we will be raised. And when this happens, Paul says, then God's word will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. It will, death has been eaten up in victory. Death will be no more. See, death will, has many victories today. But on the final day, death will not win. Death kills our bodies now, but our bodies will be raised and death will be no more. And you know, notice Paul, he begins to taunt death here as he quotes the prophets in verse 55 here. He mocks death. But notice how he switches also, not only looking to the future, that then death will be swallowed up in victory, but he comes back into the present. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where is your sting, O oh death? It's present. Where is it right now, he's saying. And he's paraphrasing the prophets, Isaiah 25, as we read it in Hosea 13. And Paul takes the, the taunt really into the life of the church that we can really right now taunt death. 
Because Jesus has come. Because Jesus has snapped its neck. Jesus has broken through death into life. He is risen. And what happens to Christ happens to us. As we inherited so much of negative things and terrible things from Adam, so we will inherit through the second Adam, Jesus, the first man of the new era, we will receive that. Paul had said that, and he just brings it out that over and over again. Verse 49 of chapter 15, just as we have bore the likeness of the earthly man, so we shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Or verse 20 of chapter 15, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He's the first fruits. He's the very beginning of it, and we will follow after him. In verse 23, he says, but each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. And Paul start, starts to pause in verse 56. Do you notice that? For some background theology. And he says the sting of, of death is sin. And we would think he would say it just the other way around, that the sting of sin is death. When we sin, then we, we end up having to die. Uh, that the wages of sin are death. But he flips it around here. And he says that the sting of death is sin. And I think what he's saying here is he's saying that not only do we have to die and go through that, but after that, the sting of sin keeps on coming after us and the law comes and, and points out on the last day of judgment or when we face the Lord that we have failed him in so many ways that our sin is really real and it really has, has caused this separation and caused great pain to everyone. The sting of, of standing before God one day in judgment. That power is given by the law to point it out to us. And so sin stings. Sin kills. It condemns. But he says, thanks be to God. For he does not leave us there. He does not leave the, us stung. He does not leave us with the poison in our veins. He gives He's gracious. He gives us the victory through Jesus. Through Jesus, the sting is gone now. Jesus takes the sting of sin for us. Jesus draws out the sin's poison by being stung himself. It's a great story that I came across this week of a father and son. They were driving in a car and they, the, the son was very, very allergic to bees and these things, and even to a point of having, maybe dying from it. You know, definitely, it would be terrible for him. And sure enough, a bee gets into the car, and the son is you know, moving around trying to get away from the bee, and the father just reaches out his hand and traps that bee in his hand. And there's a pause there, and calms down. And then he opens his hand and the bee gets out again and the, the boy gets crazy once again, naturally speaking. And then the father says, shows him, down, son, look, look at my hand. The stinger is in my hand. The bee cannot harm you. The father took the sting for his son. Jesus took the sting of death for us. And therefore the victory is ours right now. The victory is yours, Christian, right now. Because Christ has risen again. And because you will rise again. And so in a sense, the, Paul is saying that the past is now invading our present and the future is invading our present. That we have this uh, sense in which we're not crazy. We're not crazy Christians, but we're realizing that what Christ has done affects us right now. And there's a sense in which the future has come into our present. Beasley Murray, Murray, a fellow I like to read a resurrection book, he said, the final victory in which we shall share is therefore not simply limited to the future. Rather, the future has already invaded the present. And the beginning of the end has already set in. Death can already be mocked in the here and now as a defeated enemy. All because Christ is risen from the dead. And so, Christian, you can taste it, this victory. You can see it. By faith, you can hear it in God's promises of his word. And, I, and if, forgive me if this bothers you, but it, uh, it, allow me to say that you can even smell it on each other. 
Jesus, whether Paul talks about a fragrance of life that comes out from the church, it's a victory fragrance. It's a confidence fragrance because of the resurrection of Christ. Where's that evidence? Well, you don't have to go very far. You just have to read the very next verse, verse 58, to see evidence of this resurrection where Paul calls these uh, uh, Christians, dear, my dear brothers. Think of that statement. This is the, the Saul that hated Christians, now calling Christians his brothers. This is the, the one, even in the church of Corinth, where there were many who didn't like Paul. They didn't want him to be their pastor. They didn't want him to be an apostle. They questioned his leadership and questioned his motives. And yet he calls them, dear brother, how can he do that? But by the resurrection of Christ, the change that has occurred because in him, because Christ has come alive. John Newton, who wrote the, um, the great hymn, Amazing Grace. In fact, I read this week that that, that hymn is sung about 10 million times a year by Christians. <laughs> That's amazing. But his fa- my favorite quote of his is this. He says, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. Victory is ours now in Christ. We should be living this way. We should be thinking this way. The resurrection has occurred and our resurrection is as good as as, is done. And so we should have great thanks to God and great rejoicing in the church of Christ. Not just day, this day of resurrection, but but every Sunday, as every Sunday is a resurrection day. Okay, let me just summarize then what we had. Verse 50 says, what cannot happen? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 51 through 54. What must happen? The big change, the resurrection. We must be raised. Look at verse 55 through 57. What is happening right now? Yes, sin is stinging many people. Yes, the law is condemning many people. But thanks be to God that he's saving a people for himself. Because Christ has taken the sting for us. And now finally, we'll close with verse 58. What is to happen? What is to happen? Here Paul sums it all with this great therefore of the chapter. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Therefore, because of all of this, because of the resurrection of Christ, because you will be raised one day, because you have the victory in Christ, do these two things. Really, he's saying two things. Stand firm first. Stay put in your faith. Don't be led off course in all different directions. Don't be knocked off balance. Stick with the gospel. Stick with the physical resurrection of Christ. Many are doubting that and calling themselves Christians today. Stand firm in the faith. Christ is alive and it changes everything. And therefore we can go through all kinds of things because of this. We grieve, yes, as Christians, we feel lost. We're not feelingless people. But there's an ever confidence within us, a current beneath us, a, a foundation we stand on that stabilizes us and keeps us in st- trusting and confessing and holding on to Christ. Stand firm, Christian. However, you're being tested right now, stand firm in the faith. And then secondly, he says, give, give yourselves, give yourselves to the Lord's work. It's interesting, Paul doesn't say, Christ is risen from the dead, take a vacation. (laughs) Christ is risen from the dead, kick back and relax in the love of God. No, there's times for that, yes, but that's not what he's saying here. He's not saying Christ is risen, live like the rest of the world. He says, give yourself to God's work, however, what form that takes in your life. Do it sometimes? No, always, he says. Do give some of yourself? No, he says give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. The message paraphrased says, throw yourself into the work of the master. Love the people God has put in front of you. It's no coincidence that they are the ones that are there right now. Love them in Christ. Tell them of your Savior. Involve yourself in your church. You say, I can't do that. I can't even come to church right now. How can I get involved? In- oh, you can love people by calling them and writing them and sending emails to them and setting up Zoom 
uh, meetings with them. There's all kinds of ways that we as Christians need to get creative of how we can be the church still in this time of pandemic. We can say when people say to us, I, I love this, uh, Joel Beakey, I think, brought this up, that when we say he has risen, usually the response is he has risen indeed, right? But he suggested that we respond with a question. He has risen and then respond by saying, so what are you going to do about it? <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Or better yet, better yet, what are we going to do about it? What can we do now that Christ has risen? That's what Paul was doing in this verse. He's telling us that there's no labor too hard. There's no cost too great. There's no task too humble to not serve Christ. That your labor in the Lord, whatever it may be, it may not even be seen by anybody else. It may seem very insignificant to you. It may even be criticized by others, but it won't ever be forgotten by your Lord. It won't, won't ever be for nothing. God will use it in his plan, however small it is. I was thinking about, as I wrote this sermon, and I looked up on my, uh, uh, there's a picture that I, that's right where I am sitting. It's right in front of me. And it's a picture of uh, a little child uh, sleeping uh, contentedly uh, on the side of a, a giant dog that's about twice the size of, of the child. And where did I get that picture? Well, my mother would go visit a lady years ago, years ago. And when I was about five years old, she'd go visit this lady and tell her about the Lord. And I think the lady was a Christian. She was about 100 years old. It wasn't just she seemed 100 years old. I think she really was 100 years old. And, 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 and when and that, that older lady would always comment that I liked that picture. And I always look at that picture. And when she died and went to heaven, she gave me that picture. And you think of the little acts of kindness that affect people for all of their lives. A little act of kindness of my mom visiting her, the little act of kindness of this lady thinking of me in her death. Those little acts of kindness add up. They reach far. Christian, what you do is important. Do those little things. Won't you do those little things for Christ? He's risen from the dead. Won't you serve him? Have you, have you discovered the therefore of the empty tomb, the therefore of the resurrection? Stand firm. Give yourself always to the work of the Lord. This is the time of resurrection service. What are we waiting for? Let's serve the Lord together. Well, I've asked a lot of questions this morning. Let me close with this. These questions are important questions, but there's the most important question is this. Will you be raised on the last day? Will you be given this big change, this resurrection body? And you might say, how could I possibly know that? I'm not there yet. Oh, but the scripture says you can. It says that those trusting in Jesus, trusting that he died for them, that he rose for them, that he kept the law perfectly for them who defeated death. Those who trust him will be given this resurrection body. But without trust in Christ, without Jesus, the sting is still in us and it will conventionally eat away at us until we'll have no capacity to know God, no capacity to be with God. Without Jesus, our labor really is in vain. It will count for nothing in the end. Without Jesus, our sins will condemn us. But there's only one hope. Your only hope is to belong to this Jesus, to enter his victory. How do you do this? By trusting him, by standing with him, by believing his death was died for you, by believing in his resurrection is your resurrection. If not, you're going to always fear death. If not, you're always going to be fearing the future in the next pandemic or the next crisis. You're always going to be living and your life living without much meaning or no meaning at all. If not, if you don't trust Christ, you'll never know God. You've been made to know him, but you'll never know him. And the last day, your sins will condemn you. 
And that's no way to live. That's no way to die. Trust Jesus and death will not harm you. Trust Jesus and the sting of sin will not sting you. Trust Jesus and the truth about you will never condemn you. Christ will cover that with his blood, with his love, with his death and resurrection. And you will enter the kingdom of God. You'll be joined to Jesus forever. And you will be changed. You will be raised imperishable on the last day. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, help us to hear your word coming to us. Not a nagging word, but a comforting word. Word that shows us that you have done it all for us. You have risen and we will rise too. Lord, may we trust you. May we continue to stand firm in our faith and continue to give of our lives. Use your church in these times. Use us, your people. You are doing a work that we cannot see right now. But we know that you're always working. And you're always doing. And you're always giving glory to yourself. Lord, may we fit into that. Help us. May we share and walk in this great victory of the resurrection. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, amen.